All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So today we're talking about thoracic outlet syndrome. So here's just a brief outline. Uh, we'll talk about the definition, uh, relevant anatomy, some of the uh, history and physical findings with the different types of thoracic outlet syndrome, and then how we treat them. So in general, the definition of thoracic outlet syndrome, regardless of type, is uh, compression of the neurovascular structures of the thoracic outlet. Um, so Todd, can you just tell us what is the thoracic outlet? Like, what are the structures that make that up? Yeah. Um, so here's the, like, when I was learning anterior to posterior, and here, so it's the clavian vein, uh, and then anterior scalene, or sorry, phrenic nerve, and then scalene, and then uh, it's the clavian artery, brachial plexus, and the scalene. Yeah, so that's, so that's the structures that we're talking about that as they exit, as they exit the chest, the thoracic outlet itself really is, is sort of this plane um, created by the bony structures of the chest. So it's really the first ribs, the sternum and the vertebrae. So that's what we're talking about as things are exiting the chest. So just like you said, those neurovascular structures are the things that we're worried about. Um, so these, this compression uh, can occur like you were saying, through the two nerves, arteries, or the artery of the vein. Um, so I have percentages up here, and I was meant to ask this as a question, but um, the, by far the most common type of thoracic outlet syndrome is neurogenic. So this is a vascular surgery talk, obviously. The, we get excited about treating, you know, venous and arterial uh, thoracic outlet, but those are actually much less common than, uh, than neurogenic. So we'll talk about some of the anatomy more in detail. So in general, we have these, uh, there's lots of triangles here. So the scalene triangle is sort of the one that um, Todd was alluding to. Um, the scalene triangle itself is bordered by the anterior scalene muscle, um, the middle scalene, and the first rib inferiorly. And so it runs through that triangle would be the subclavian artery and the, um, the nerves that make up the brachial plexus. Uh, the costoclavicular space is another important space. And really, when we talk about uh, the pathophysiology of thoracic outlet syndrome, this is where the compression is occurring. Um, and then the pectoralis minor space is another thing to think about, not necessarily for TOS um, per se, but there's a, a similar syndrome called pectoralis minor syndrome, which can mimic TOS and cause some similar symptoms, but from a different uh, anatomic origin. So this is that uh, a diagram of, of the order of things um, as Todd was describing them. So you see the phrenic nerve anteriorly, obviously the vein is not here, um, but you have the phrenic nerve, the anterior scalene, and then the artery. Um, posterior to the artery, you have the, um, the brachial plexus. Um, it should be noted too that there can be different configurations, not necessarily anterior to posterior, but the shape of this triangle can change. So important to think about if you're doing a scalenectomy, sometimes there's uh, more space within this triangle, there's more connective, connective tissue to work around. Sometimes those nerve roots are really right up against the middle scalene. So that can be a little bit more difficult as far as the dissection. Um, and then uh, other nerves to think about We'll, we'll talk about that too, but long thoracic would be one of those. Um, so here's some other triangles. Um, again, this is more looking at where the compression actually occurs that causes the symptoms. So um, you have the venous triangle and then the arterial and neurologic triangle. So the venous triangle, um, really when we talk about venous TOS, we're talking about primarily a fibrous band that is attached to the subclavius muscle that compresses that subclavian vein. Um, the arterial neurologic triangle, it can be from a similar process from fibrosis of the um, tendinous uh, tissues of the subclavius muscle or from hypertrophy of the scalene muscles themselves. Um, this is just a different view. So you can see the, the clavicle at the top of this picture in the first rib on the bottom. So this is sort of looking down on that space. 
Um, just an, again, just another view there. And then other, other structures to think about um, when we're operating in this area. So the dorsal scapular nerve um, is one of the first branches off the brachial plexus, uh, comes off posteriorly, innerv innervates some of the um, muscles around the scapula, like the rhomboids. Um, and then the cervical sympathetic chain is also certainly something important to think about. So these scalene muscles, um, their origin is on the transverse processes of the cervical vertebrae. Um, and so when you're up around that area, taking the scalene off of the transverse processes, the cervical sympathetic chain is immediately medial. So uh, that's one way that that can get injured. Um, can any of the medical students tell me what would happen if you injured the cervical sympathetic chain? What's that syndrome called? Anybody know? Yeah, it would be cause a Horner syndrome, exactly. So what, what is that? What, what kind of findings do you have with that? Sure, yeah, so it's certainly going to be asymmetric, but what you're going to have is meiosis, so that's going to be the asymmetric pupils, right, and then anhydrosis on the affected side. Um, all right, and then we'll talk about some bony anomalies too. So um, the difference between cervical ribs and first ribs is important to understand. It can be very confusing, admittedly, um, but just to illustrate what some of these things actually are. So a true cervical rib is, is a rib that comes off the C7 transverse process. And what's interesting about this is it actually only has one articulation with vertebrae, whereas all the all of the rest of our ribs, when they articulate with vertebrae, they articulate with the one, one above and below, whereas the cervical rib only comes off the C7. So it's it's that's why it's, some people would call it a false rib because it, it doesn't serve the same function. Um, some patients can have bilateral cervical ribs, um, but then other patients can have an anomalous first rib, which is different. So an anomalous first rib can there's lots of different variations of this, but it essentially inserts in some other way than where it normally inserts. And, and the configuration of that anomalous first rib can contribute to thoracic outlet compression. Um, the reason it's important to think about and know about these things, um, certainly if you're planning any operative intervention for decompression, it's important to know which bony structures are actually contributing uh, because for some patients, it may not actually be the cervical rib that is the problem, whereas in other patients, it, it may be attributable to that. Um, and we'll talk about that with the different types of TOS. Um, again, hammering home some more anatomy. So these nerve relationships on the left, uh, we're looking at some of the nerves and their relationships to the brachial plexus. Um, so again, the phrenic nerve is coming off anteriorly. So, so certainly have to be like uh, in, so you can eat. So certainly have to be aware of that. Um, but and then the long thoracic nerve. Yes. Uh, so you can eat. So, um, Frank, what happens if you injure the long thoracic nerve? What's the uh, physical exam finding that you have? Wing scapula. Perfect. Yep. So we often talk about this when we talk about axillary dissection for breast cancer, but it comes off way higher, right? So that can happen from from uh, dissecting in that area as well. Um, the picture on the right I found really helpful because this is sort of the anatomy that you'll see in the OR because oftentimes you'll have the, the patient's arm um, sort of flexed up and across their chest. Um, so you, what we're looking at is rather than everything sort of coming down and out the chest, it's sort of coming up towards the top of the screen. Okay, so history and physical findings. So in general, uh, this is much more common in people in, in young adults. Um, so ages 20 to 40s, um, occasionally even younger. So teenage athletes, for example, or, or populations particularly at risk. For whatever, for, for some reason, it's not entirely clear. There's It's more common in females, so about a 70-30 ratio. Um, and interestingly, although cervical ribs are more common in females, it's thought that that's not responsible entirely for the difference 
in, in um, gender prevalence. Um, and we always hear about, you know, occupational or recreational activities. So um, really this is anything overhead is the one that always comes up on a test, right? So tennis or a baseball pitcher, um, they often talk about, you know, Olympic weightlifters, all those, those types of um, sports activities. Another one that uh, was, was sort of new to me was prolonged sitting at a computer because of the way that um, some people hold their shoulders when they're typing on a keyboard all day. Um, apparently can contribute to some of those fibrous bands that can cause uh, compression. Um, interestingly, a lot of these patients have some history of head and neck trauma. Um, so clavicle fracture with non-union is a relatively common uh, predisposing factor. Um, it's not entirely clear the connection between the traumatic injury and the development of thoracic outlet syndrome, but there's thought to be some there's at least an observed uh, relationship there. Um, what's important to know is that the history of the symptoms and the pattern of the symptoms can usually tell you whether this is neurogenic, venous, or arterial. Um, and we'll talk about that in detail in the next couple of slides. Some exam maneuvers um, to be aware of. So, you know, really a comprehensive and with lots of detailed evaluation is very important. Um, largely to rule out other pathology. So there's lots of other things that can cause pain, numbness, paresthesias in the upper extremity, um, whether that's carpal tunnel or um, lot, lots of other, you know, rotator cuff pathology or other brachial plexopathies. There's lots of different things. Um, so looking for all of those other causes is going to be really important. And a lot of those you can see on physical exam. So for example, um, patients that have tenderness in places except in places other than specifically the scalene triangle or the subcoracoid space where um, where we were talking about the subclavius muscle where that sits, that points to some other etiology. And in a lot of the patients, particularly with neurogenic TOS, that points more to something like a fibromyalgia or a functional pain syndrome. Um, one of the more pathognomonic tests, uh, I shouldn't say pathognomonic, but one of the more specific tests is what's called this elevated arm stress test. And so what this is, is abduction of the, of the shoulder um, and flexion of the elbow. And what you have the patient do is um, repeatedly open and close their fist for three minutes. So most patients, if this test is gonna be positive, it's gonna be positive within the first 30 seconds. Um, and when a positive test is signified by having paresthesias and pain uh, that reproduces their symptoms. Um, Importantly, this also has a high negative predictive value. So it's, it's not, if you have a positive test, it doesn't necessarily mean you have thoracic outlet syndrome. If it's negative, it's, it's very good at ruling it out. Um, the ADSA maneuver is something else that's described, uh, less sensitive and less specific. So this involves um, measuring the, or essentially palpating the radial pole. Um, Having the arm abducted, you have the you turn the neck to the contralateral side. Patient, take a deep breath. If the radial pulse decreases with all those maneuvers all together, that's a positive Atson test. Um, now, because most TOS is neurogenic, this is not going to be as sensitive or specific for most patients with TOS. But if it is arterial, um, theoretically, this could be helpful. So we'll go into some of the more details about um, spe uh, the specific, excuse me, specific types. So for venous thoracic outlet, um, there's essentially two main presentations to know. So one is paget schroeder syndrome. Um, this one comes up often. So this is an acute thrombosis of the axillary vein or subclavian vein. Um, oftentimes, the way this shows up in questions, for example, is, you know, a baseball pitcher comes in with a very large swollen blue arm with paresthesias and pain. Um, so it can present, it, I mean, essentially is an acute DVT. And so it can present like or even progress to a phlegmasia type picture. Um, so these are patients that do need urgent intervention. And in general, uh, and we'll get, the, get to this later too, but in general, Okay, uh, what's recommended uh, is uh, is more urgent drama. Um, 
the other presentation for venous uh, TOS, as opposed to the acute onset, would be a chronic intermittent obstruction to the vein, which can cause more of a, a venous, <laughs> uh, sure cause more of a venous hypertension or venous insufficiency. So from repetitive compression of the cystating vein, you get uh, engorgement of the veins in the upper extremities, so that could lead to swelling, uh, heaviness, those sorts of things. Next slide, obviously. <laughs> arterial thrombus. So for arterial TOS, um, in general, we're talking about uh, the consequences of upper extremity ischemia. So usually, you know, oftentimes in vascular surgeries, particularly when we're talking about atherosclerotic disease, we're thinking about lower extremity ischemia. Upper extremity ischemia is less common. Um, and so if you do find a patient with upper primary upper extremity arterial ischemia, it's important to think about thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, so this, in, in much the same way as the lower extremity, you can see like emboli, um, you can see aneurysmal degeneration uh, over time. Um, and interestingly, particularly when there's a cervical rib involved, those are patients that are at higher risk for having uh, aneurysmal degeneration of, of the subclavian artery. The other thing to look for is a unilateral Raynaud's phenomenon. Um, so that's pretty uncommon. Most people that have Raynaud's syndrome or the phenomenon is a part of another tissue disorder, it's bilateral. So unilateral Raynaud's should definitely clue you into something else. Um, and then something else that we don't come across all that often, so signs of distal embolization in the upper extremity. Uh, so digi digital ischemia, particularly when it's one digit, um, that's pretty uncommon. And then splinter hemorrhages uh, is one of those... Uh, pathognomonic signs for microemboli. Um, so essentially what can happen is you have aneurysmal degeneration of the subclavian artery and you form a thrombus because of all the turbulent flow. Um, it, you can shower off these microemboli that go to the, the distal uh, digits. So what are some adjunctive tests uh, for diagnosing this? So plain radiographs are important, like we talked about, to find cervical ribs or anomalous first ribs. Um, CT and MRI can be helpful primarily for ruling out other etiologies. Um, something in particular to think about with venous, for example, would be like a, you know, Pancos tumor or otherwise an SVC syndrome. There's lots of other things that you could find, uh, but it's important to rule those out before pursuing a treatment of a thoracic outlet. Um, if there's suspicion for arterial or venous, then CTA or MRA can be useful because they're uh, relatively non-invasive. Um, EMG and nerve conduction studies can be helpful if you're thinking more of a neurogenic etiology um, to sort of differentiate this from other uh, processes. And for whatever reason, the median antibrachial cutaneous nerve is one that's pretty specific for thoracic outlet. So if, if it, it's pretty uncommon to otherwise have that as a single um, fiber or neuropathy Whereas if multiple other nerves are involved, particularly, you know, median nerve would be more consistent with carpal tunnel, for example. So th this, these kind of studies can be helpful for finding other etiologies. Um, the anterior scaling block is an important one to, to talk about. So in a patient who has neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, um, what anterior scaling block can do is to help us decide if we're going to treat this surgically, what approach would be most helpful? So is this patient going to benefit more from scalenectomy because that's where their compression is happening? Or is, do they need more of a first rib resection or do they need both? So essentially this, this, can, be, this can be diagnostic and therapeutic as well. So if, uh, you know, if an anterior scaling block relieves the patient's symptoms um, and, and that symptom relief persists long-term, you may be able to avoid operative management. Um, alternatively, if it temporarily relieves your symptoms and it comes back, then that's somebody who you might think a scalenectomy might be um, appropriate definitive management for them. Again, for patients who have uh, more signs of arterial or venous, non-invasive studies are certainly helpful. Uh, so we're talking about duplex ultrasonography. Um, and then operative venography is another uh, adjunct that can be occasionally helpful, um, although the, the text mentions that it's much more rare that that is a primary diagnostic test. So for neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, this is this is the the one of the key take-home points is that for 
the majority of patients who have thoracic outlet, they're, it's going to be neurogenic. And for the majority of those patients, physical therapy is going to be the definitive treatment. Um, most of these patients don't progress towards surgery. Um, it is important to note, though, that there are significantly better outcomes with physical therapists who have experience treating thoracic outlet uh, because a lot of their typical paradigms are sort of flipped when it comes to managing this condition. So it's not necessarily um, more rest or more strengthening. It's, it's a different combination. And I, I wish I knew more about the details of that, but um, important to think about. Some, some medications can be helpful, you know, gabapentinoids, that sort of thing. Um, but surgical de decompression is certainly an option. Um, interestingly, the outcomes have been shown to be better in patients who are younger and in patients who don't have neuropsychiatric comorbidities. So there seems to be quite a bit of overlap with um, fibromyalgia and functional pain type syndromes and neurogenic outlet. So it's important to counsel those patients that, you know, if, if they have some of these other findings, they may not benefit as much from surgery or meaning they may not, may not have as durable outcomes. For, for like I mentioned, for, um, so for Paget Schroeder syndrome, presenting with a swollen blue extremity, uh, potentially even phlegmasia, um, catheter reductive thrombolysis is, has sort of emerged as uh, one of the go-to treatment strategies. This is not for every patient that presents with this kind of phenomenon, but it can be helpful um, essentially to immediately relieve the venous obstruction. Because um, as we always learn, the biggest thing with preventing the sequela of this is clot time against valve, right? So if you are able to get rid of the clot sooner, you'll have uh, fewer um, post-thrombotic complications. But the other important thing is to follow that with either surgical decompression and or um, some sort of intervention for the vein itself. So the thrombolysis alone is not going to fix the problem because it's, you know, if, if it's from thoracic outlet compression, that needs to be addressed. Um, they do mention too that endovascular therapy should never be attempted prior to surgical decompression, which I found interesting. So, you know, it, other places in the body, sometimes uh, the example that comes to mind would be like a May Thurner syndrome, where stenting the vein is one of the primary modalities of treatment. The issue here is because of the bony structures, the rate of stent fracture is pretty high. And so that um, those repairs will often go down because of instant thrombosis or because of stent hey, fracture. Thanks. Got to go. Um, the other presentation, McCurry, uh, that's a misspelling, I apologize, McCleary syndrome, um, surgical decompression with venoplasty is, is the treatment of choice uh, because it's not an acute process. Catheter-directed thrombolysis is not helpful. For arterial, um, I'll very briefly go through this share classification. So this basically breaks it down into the degree of arterial damage to the subclavian artery and um, what needs to be done. So for stage zero, this is essentially a patient who has an incidental finding of subclavian arterial compression at the thoracic outlet and is asymptomatic. Those patients don't need to be treated. Um, for patients that have mild stenosis with a mild degree of post-stenotic dilatation and no intimal disruption, um, those patients can be managed with just surgical decompression. And you would expect that the aneurysmal degeneration that has started to occur will remodel over the course of six months to a year. So surgical decompression is alone is sufficient. Um, if you do have intimal injury or mural thrombus, um, then you do need to intervene in the artery. So that could mean an interposition graft. Hey bud, let's go. We gotta go. Early, early. Okay. Bypass. And then for patients who are having signs of disembolization, uh, they may need thrombolysis or thrombectomy first, uh, followed by And then finally, you know, we're running out of time, we'll talk about briefly what are the options for decompression. Um, so in general, like we said, a first rib resection, uh, there's removal of cervical ribs, and then occasionally we do need to also do work on the artery of the vein. So for, um, this is this is highly controversial. Okay, is it coming off? Yeah, okay. Um, hey, Pam, Pam, can, Pam can you mute? Oh, sorry. 
Uh, many people do prefer a transaxillary approach for patients who you're doing just a first rib resection. Um, the reason is the thought is postoperative pain is a little bit lower. The incision is more hidden because it's in the hair bearing area. It's along the hair bearing area, area, excuse me, area of the axilla, um, as opposed to a supra or infraclavicular incision, which would be more visible. Um, and the thought is that this is also a better approach for resecting the first rib circumferentially as opposed to only resecting the anterior part of the rib where the compression is occurring. So for certain patients, um, particularly neurogenic, this would probably be a better option so that you can actually remove an entire segment of the rib as opposed to just taking off the anterior part. Um, you can do a scalenectomy through this approach as well. Um, and then uh, you can approach the vein from, tran uh, from a tra transaxillary approach. But in general, if vascular work is needed, uh, either to the artery or the vein, in general, supraclavicular approach is best. And that's sometimes combined with an infraclavicular approach, depending on um, how far proximal or distal um, the venoplasty or arterial reconstruction would need to be. Um, and then we'll finish up talking about um, complications of surgical decompression. So. The biggest one to think about is persistent or recurrent thoracic outlet syndrome. So this is almost always due to inadequate uh, decompression, but it can also be due to uh, recurrent fibrosis in that, that costoclavicular space. Um, it's not uncommon, particularly with, with neurogenic, um, but certainly some of these counsel patients about. Um, pneumothorax can occur. So you know, anytime we're worrying, working near the thoracic outlet, the apex of the lung comes up near there. Um, usually these are very small. These can be managed non-operatively. Occasionally they may need uh, some sort of chest tube. Uh, phrenic nerve injury we talked about. Um, fortunately, because these are usually unilateral, they're relatively asymptomatic and um, oftentimes don't require any further intervention. Uh, long thoracic nerve we talked about already. Um, lymph leaks are relatively common in part through a transaxial approach, you're gonna be disrupting a lot of those lymphatics. It's relatively uncommon to injure the thoracic duct itself, uh, but certainly that would be a more problematic complication as far as managing their lymphatic drainage. But for this reason, um, uh, it seems that most people advocate for leaving a drain in anticipation of some level of lymph leak postoperatively. Um, and then Horner syndrome we talked about. So the way that that happens is during a scalenectomy, you can have thermal spread uh, to the cervical sympathetic chain. Or if you're doing a meticulous neurolysis of those nerve roots, uh, if, if that's where the compression is occurring with the scalenes, you, um, obviously you can directly injure the nerves that way too. So kind of flew through that last part about um, surgical decompression, but does anybody have any questions or um, any of the vascular staff any have any um, points to add? Yeah, I would say for the uh, choice of location of incision, I think you, you did a good job. So I think a lot of it is where you train, proper trained under like the world expert in transaxillary. So he does almost everything transaxillary. But I agree, if you need to do any sort of um, significant venolysis or arterial reconstruction, you're gonna wanna do super or infra or both. Um, I personally did all of ours super on infraclavicular. Um, and it's just a, it's a little more gratifying of an operation and you definitely can get out the full rib. There's nothing about only getting out the anterior portion of the rib um, doing uh, that dissection. You are more closely associated with the brachial plexus and the phrenic nerve. So it's a little, uh, and, and you're dissecting more lymphatics as you get that, ex, that fat pad out of there. So. Um, there's definitely some reasons that transaxillary has some positives, especially the incisions hidden and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I think it's, um, uh, dealer's choice for most of it, especially neurogenic. Um, they're fine if you, but if, if you're answering a question on any sort of reconstruction of vessels or uh, significant venoplasty, I would choose, um, one of the paraclavicular incisions. Um, but yeah, and I, I think just mostly it's where you train, you know, this is something even in, I mean, unless you're at a high volume fellowship, you're probably doing like five a year. Um, and then, you know, probably here we're doing a couple handful a year. Um, so it's not something you're gonna be uh, adept at both 
uh, methods, in my opinion, but there's, I'm sure there's some people that are, but so that, that's just sort of my thoughts. I'm, I'm sure some of the other staff have some thoughts on their choice of incision. I have a question. Is there any role for endovascular management of the, um, after you do thrombolysis, but like, let's say there's a scar stenosis of the subclavian vein for endovascular treatment of that after you do the decompression? Almost never. It's it, These are young patients in a very highly mobile segment um, that the stent will get crushed. Um, so you, that's where you do um, a, a very good venal lysis with your, um, with your approach, with your infraclavicular approach, you're right on top of the vein. You can yeah, so there's actually some literature that suggests that after you decompress <clears throat> and you go and do your uh, venogram, you know, you try and open it back up, you do your venoplasty, but oftentimes it, it will still, you know, because of the scar tissue, will still reocclude. Patients will actually still do pretty well after decompression without placement of a stent. And I observe placing a stent only after decompression and uh, if they have significant residual symptoms. They have to pretty have to put a put a um, pretty good sized stent in there, usually like a, a 16 or you know or, uh, or 14 to 16 millimeter stent. And once you place a stent in there, especially in a young patient, you're going to expect chronic flow occlusion. But the goal is really to help provide some time for some collaterals to develop, you know, really around the, the shoulder collaterals are kind of your best friend, uh, as you can probably tell from um, uh, patients with arterial vein fistulas, you know, they may have a, a slowly chronically occluded uh, subclavian vein, but otherwise don't really have a whole lot of other symptoms. Um, so that, that's just my two cents in terms of how to manage uh, venous uh, occlusion uh, after decompression. I think that's a great point too. This is uh, Wayne Causey. The, um, the stents have also changed significantly in the last two years and that now there's FDA approved venous stents. And so previously we had tried to stick mainly with angioplasty because there weren't FDA approved venous stents and people were gonna be getting stents, you know, 22 and 25 years old and they were gonna be used in off-label circumstances. Like for instance, uh, uh, some of the stents we would use for the same problem were approved for biliary indications, you know, decades ago. But now we have FDA approved uh, venous stents. And so um, decompressing the rib and then putting in a, a venous stent is sort of the way people are starting to lean now in treatment of this disease process for venous TOS.